Hello everyone and welcome back to Everyday Anarchism. The cicadas are really going outside. I don't know if you can hear them. I've got a second anniversary episode coming up with Ruth Kinna. I've got the Debt series going. I am recording episodes right now for the series on the English Revolution and I'm really trying, mostly so I can keep everything together, to shift this show into some longer term series instead of whatever interesting book or idea skittered into view. But this week's interview with Kristen Godsey is one of those Monster of the Week episodes. Uh, that's an X-Files reference for those of you who are too young to know what X-Files is or too old to know what X-Files is. Only 90s kids know what a Monster of the Week episode is. Anyway, um, I couldn't pass this one up. It skittered into my view and stayed there because Kristen's book is called Everyday Utopia. And as you will hear in our interview, she is a feminist socialist whose book really grapples with and takes insight from the works of anarchists, especially Bakunin and, of course, Graeber. There's not really an intro once we get talking because I flubbed that. So after the music, it goes straight into the conversation. Enjoy. So you're the author of the book, Everyday Utopia. So major um, title synergy between this podcast, Everyday yes. Anarchism, and the book, Everyday Utopia. And I I just want to say I was thrilled reading this book. And obviously, I'm very interested in the subject matter, but also because I don't know. I mean, I'll give you credit for this personally, certainly, but I think there's also been a larger awareness among people on the left, socialists, communists, whatever you want to have them, of the sort of anarchist critiques of socialism and the anarchist tradition. And you can tell me about your, I feel like if someone wrote this book 15 years ago, there probably would not have been a lot of Bakunin and Proudhon and Kropotkin in it. I'm guessing if you wrote this book 15 years ago, that might not have been the case. So maybe we can start there with how anarchism, you know, in, infiltrated your set of ideas, and then we can talk through what 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 your ideas look like in dialogue with anarchism. Yeah, so I can tell you that I have been teaching a class at the university level called Sex and Socialism since 2003, so literally 20 years now, two decades. And in 2004 or five, I can't remember which, I read Bakunin's God in the State. Mm. And that was a really profound text for me. And partially it was profound because of his atheist arguments. I really, I suddenly, I was raised Catholic and I, I wouldn't consider myself an extremely pious person, but I was, you know, I was raised within a Puerto Rican religious tradition, which is very Catholic. And Bakunin did this thing that made me understand the role of religion. It was, it was this incredible kind of like the scales fell from my eyes sort of moment of like, oh, that's why religion works the way that it does. And that's how much better we'll all be off if we can get rid of this thing. But I never really took seriously his critique of the state <laughs> because for me, the big boogeyman was religion. And second of all, because I, I think I really self-identified much more as somebody who thought that the state was something that could be captured by the people for the purpose of doing good on behalf of the people who would then control it. So then I came back to Bakunin, you know, 18 years later, and I, I really sunk my teeth into that book. God in the state. And for the first time, I mean, not for the first time, but really seriously considered that the state might also be part of the problem. And for me, as a socialist feminist, as somebody who comes out of a long tradition of addressing political needs to this body of the state, you know, on behalf of the people, and particularly on behalf of caregivers, people who give, uh, who do caregiving work in our economies that is 
largely unremunerated. It, it really, it, 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 it like, it wounded me in a way. I thought, oh my goodness, here's this really not coherent because Bakunin is not coherent, <laughs> he's never, but in, he's never coherent, <laughs> but he's interesting and he's provocative. And so for me, rereading Bakunin, especially during the pandemic, when I came back to Bakunin, I suddenly realized that if I really truly wanted to engage in this idea of what happens when the state is not responsive? What if we address claims to the state and the state does not respond? Or worse, that the state actually actively works against us. Are there still things that we can do? Are there still capacities that we have? Are there still moments of hope and optimism? And so as I was writing this book and really exploring the history of all of these different utopian ideas, these utopian ways of reorganizing our private lives, so that we could live in a more contented and connected way, there in the background was Bakunin. <laughs> he was niggling in my consciousness. And I thought, okay, I really have to address the anarchists. So I designed a syllabus. Uh, I, I read Kropotkin. I had read Kropotkin. I had read Mutual Aid when I was much younger. But I went back and I really closely read Conquest of Bread, which I think is a fantastic book. Um, I knew Proudhon, uh, and then of course, there's always the wonderful David Graeber. <laughs> um, I, and so I, I developed a syllabus, which I was supposed to teach in the spring of 2021, but for pandemic related reasons, that didn't happen. And then I taught it this last spring, which was called Anarchism Theories and Ethnographies. So it was, a, a, it was sort of a, a course that was basically combining theory with actually studies of ethnographic ethnographic studies of communities that practice anarchism on their everyday level, on an everyday sort of scale, mostly in Eastern Europe, because that's my area of expertise. And it was in the process of teaching that class and in the process of engaging with students, many of whom themselves self-identified with anarchists, that I really, you know, it, it, it started, there was this narrative in my mind of, okay, I need to address these bigger questions and I need to be in dialogue with people who are always and fundamentally suspicious of the state. Yeah, well, I think absolutely the book does a great job of that. We can, I'm already ready to um, move on because I've already had so many ideas listening to you as you, as you were talking about that. And I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, the, the problem that I see and that, that this makes the anarchism very productive, but the problem that emerges in your book is the problem of the everyday. I've always hated the slogan, smash the patriarchy, because it always seemed, and, and I could never put my finger on it, but it always seemed to miss the point. Smash the patriarchy made it sound like the patriarchy was like the the U.S. government or a corporation that there was a room, you know, where men got together. And in fact, I would argue the patriarchy is 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 mutual aid. It's anarchistic in in that way. It's bonds of solidarity for men with other men in which they mutually agree to hold women and children in dominion, in in the domestic sphere, which as Graeber and Wingrove point out in their book, The Dawn of Everything, domestic comes from dominion. That's the patriarchy. You can't smash it outside. It doesn't exist outside, except as these loose, almost like horizontal bonds of men with other men. The place you have to smash it and you can't smash the patriarchy, but you can smash patriarchal relations or something like that, is in the home, is in the everyday. And I just thought this book, Everyday Utopia, did such a good job of homing in on the way that the patriarchy is not is not the kind of thing that you can imagine. Like that stupid 1984 ad, the Apple ad where yes. someone runs in and what, like throws the, a hammer or something? A hammer, yeah. There's no, there's no <laughs> room like that to smash with the patriarchy. It's, it's all, it's our families right. where the patriarchy has to be smashed. And that is so difficult and, and uncomfortable. And I feel like an anarchist imaginary really helps you understand what that is. Yeah. So in the book, I'm very 
I almost don't really talk about patriarchy. I talk specifically about patrilineality and exactly. patrilocality, which are two concepts from anthropology that underpin our contemporary understanding of patriarchy. So patrilineality is, you know, basically if you are married, many women take their husband's name if you're in a heterosexual relationship. And if you have children in that heterosexual relationship, then the children usually bear the name of the father rather than the name of the mother. And so then that name is also the name of the grandfather and the great grandfather. And you have this whole patrilineal line, which goes back. And we can see as evolutionary anthropologists or people who are doing work in archaeogenetics, why chromosomal DNA really traces the extant, you know, remnants of patrilineal societies in the world today. Now, patrilocality is related to patrilineality in the sense that when women are married, when girls are sort of given or sold or however exchanged with uh, from fathers to husbands, particularly in patrilineal societies, then they leave their matrilineal clan or their matrilocal, like where their mothers live, and they move to the clan or the place of their husbands. And we see like in both of these cases in the contemporary United States, and I would say in many Western countries, I'm actually doing this podcast from Germany, and this is very, very clear in the German context, is that women generally tend to take the father's, uh, the husband's name. They generally tend to give their children the husband's name. And they also tend to either move close to the husband's family or in a neo-local situation, which is what we have mostly in the United States where the new couple is meant to create a new household, it's still very much the father figure, the, the male, who is the head of household. And that really shows itself in corporate life, in the military, in academia, when a male spouse moves for a job, usually, if again, in a heterosexual couple, it's the female spouse who will follow him, and she is far more likely to follow him, statistically, than a male partner is to follow a female partner, and that is a direct result of patrilocality. So there are these ways, and this is why I love the word every day, because most of us who are just going about our lives, you know, we don't think about, like, whose name we take, or, you know, when we get married and the father gives the bride away. Like, what does that mean, the father gives the bride away, right? There are all these embedded patriarchal, but they're really patrilineal and patrilocal practices that we enact every day over and over again in our everyday lives. And we do not even think for a second that if I changed my name to take my partner's last name, that I am literally reinstantiating in my personal life this long, you know, millennia long history of patriarchal domination. So, and, and I will say one other thing, which I think is really important, is that patriarchy as a structure developed under a particular set of social, economic, and political conditions. And those conditions are bad you know, largely for women and for children, but they're also bad for non-high status men, right? So it, like men who don't have the necessary accoutrements of being a patriarch are also really deeply wounded by this system. And so I do think that everybody would benefit from not necessarily hashtag smash the patriarchy, which is precisely <laughs> what you're saying, but actually interrogating these underlying practices of patrilineality and patrilocality, which end up upholding a certain vision of male dominance that we need to unpack if we're going to live in a more just, equitable, and sustainable future. Yeah, I think that's excellent. I mean, I think this is probably one of my like most controversial and least popular ideas that I mean, if you're thinking about the patriarchy, you could think about, you know, whatever, whatever we want to call them, incels, whatever, these these disaffected young men. And obviously, when we're thinking about uh, just the American neoliberal economics, that vast swath of people that are called the Trump, the Trump voters or the white working class or whatever, and so much scorn and hatred is heaped on them from the progressive left. And in a certain extent, 
they deserve all of it. But from another case, they have been they have been ground up in the same meat grinder. So if you are if you are a young man who has been, you know, what I don't know what language they would use, but forced into involuntary celibacy, there is a good left-wing critique of the way sex works and gender works that those incels that, that it's right there for them and then after they make that critique the the solution they propose in the same way that the working class in america proposes the solution of trumpism to a real real terrible problem and they propose an even more terrible solution they double down on the misogyny but it's hard for me at least when i'm speaking to people who aren't socialists, you know, your sort of standard issue Obama Democrat, there's real demonization of these people, especially, you know, and I want to say to these people I'm talking to that are making six figures as doctors or lawyers or whatever, and we're just like, oh, I hate those, you know, what's wrong with those incels? They're so misogynist. It's like, well, you you are probably a part of the problem. And it's really hard to get them to understand they're a part of the problem because their identity is that they are that they are one of the good guys. And this much more fine-grained analysis that you're doing in this book, I think is just vital. Yeah, you know, I I do spend a lot of time, you know, there are these economic studies that have been done that show that in deindustrializing areas of Pennsylvania, for instance, that when jobs move overseas for whatever reason, usually because corporations are trying to increase their profits, the marriage rates for especially young men, you know, they fall there, you know, there's a direct Mm. economic consequence of capitalism. And, you know, it is a classic move, I think, for economic elites who are benefiting from moving jobs abroad to blame women, to blame immigrants, and to blame minorities and people of color for what are ultimately economic decisions that are being made in the interests of profit. And I understand very well that there are a lot of young people in the United States, a lot of men in the United States who are very angry at what has happened to what used to be a really thriving manufacturing sector in the United States, that we once had an economy that could really fruitfully employ people with high school you know, graduation, high school diplomas, you didn't have to go to college to have a decent life. And the erosion of that is the result of a particular brand of neoliberal capitalism that is about outsourcing and automation. And in order to deflect attention from the true culprits, right, they blame women and they blame minorities and they blame immigrants. And that's like, I'm sorry to use this word, I don't use this word lightly, but that's like a classic fascist tactic Mm. is to blame the people who are weaker than you rather than to blame the people who are stronger than you, which are these people who are in charge of making economic decisions about whether this factory stays in Texas or whether this factory stays in Pennsylvania or whether it moves to Mexico or China. Now I'm not, you know, I mean, we live in a global economy and so you know, we, and we don't have democratic control over our (laughs) enterprises, so they can do whatever the hell they want. But, but I do, I do think it's worth being very sensitive to this idea that people are angry about what's happening and that maybe they're slightly misplacing the blame for what's happening. I wouldn't say slightly misplacing. I would say they're greatly misplacing, but the, the, the source of the anger Right. It's legitimate. It's legitimate. It's totally mm. legitimate. I, I mean, I do think that they're, yeah, they're, they're misplacing the anger. I mean, there's very clear, it's a very, you can draw a very clear line. And, and if you want to go to the economics journals and you want to look at, you know, all of this discussion about what happens to, and I hate this term, but they use this term in economics all the time, the marriage market. Right, as if like people are eligible to get married, it's like a market transaction, and how men's value as providers is diminished when jobs get moved overseas. I mean, that I mean, economists have found that that's very, very clear. We see that marriage rates 
for higher socioeconomic classes are much higher. And for, you know, lower socioeconomic classes, particularly among those who only have high school diplomas, are lower. Why? Because we live in a market economy where people are literally treating each other like commodities. And that is the root of the problem. It's not women or men or immigrants or, you know, um, people of color or, or, or people of different sexualities or people who have different ideas. It's this fundamental system that makes us all look at each other as if we are commodities. And so much of my work has been about trying to decommodify ourselves and expand our notion of the family so that when we are seeking potential partners, when we're thinking about raising children, when we're thinking about creating domestic spaces, that we're not making those decisions based on economic considerations, but making those decisions based on affective considerations. That may sound really radical, but I actually don't think it's that radical. I think it's the way that human beings have lived for millennia. And it's just that we're in a particularly weird historical moment where everything is a commodity. Yeah, I think that's a great point. The 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 market in that way as it as it relates to something like dating, the mate, the mating market, it show it 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 shows you what kind of decisions are being made and how they're being made. And then these this gets channeled back into some a, a form of misogyny. It's sort of like it starts as it starts as maybe not precisely misogyny, but it starts as a you know set of relationships that oppress women. Then it becomes a source of economic distress for men who can't enter into these patriarchal relationships with women. And then it gets, you know, turned back into a new form of misogyny, which is reinforced, which then alienates these men even more from, you know, the the financial market and economic status. And it just becomes this re reinforcing cycle. And it does seem like a different way of feeling uh, is is the only way to break it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. Like, you know, one of the things that I, I say in the book, and I think it's really important to emphasize this, is that patriarchy hurts men a lot. Um, when you see the kind of ha hashtag smash the patriarchy yeah. memes, it's almost always, a, a, you know, a cisgendered woman. But in fact, I think some of the biggest victims of our current system of organizing power and wealth and privilege does much more damage in the long run to men who are excluded from these roles. And, and you can see it, right? Because what happens is that the patriarchal heterosexual nuclear family becomes the unit in society that facilitates the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. And so, so much in our society is about this intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege, as I, I know you know. Um, and so, and, and, and I've heard you talk about this, about, um, you know, UNC and how the, you know, kids of the sort of upper class are precarious and they feel like if, if, if their parents can't sort of snowplow them into the future, they're going to fall and they might literally die, right? Like there's, the stakes in the United States are way higher than they are in Germany where I am right now. I mean, in Germany, there's a huge social safety net. And if you're a carpenter or a plumber, you're going to be fine. You know, you're going to be really fine. Your, your kids are going to be fine. You have health insurance. Your kids are going to have access to education. There's great public transportation. There's all sorts of ways in which the working class here is truly you know, people with just a high school diploma are really taken care of in the way that in the United States, like you can fall so far before there's even the thread barest net to catch you. So, th so I think that's really important to remember that, that the situation in the United States is kind of extreme in this regard. Um, the French call it, you know, savage capitalism. <laughs> um, they, that's their term for it, capitalism sauvage or whatever. I don't know how to speak French, but, but um, as opposed to sort of cuddly capitalism, right, which is capitalism that is built with all these extra safety nets so that you can't fall that far, so that you can take risks without, you know, losing it all. But, but I think that, you know, we have to recognize that in the contemporary moment within which we are living, Patriarchy and patriarchal institutions like patrilocality and patrilineality, they uphold a certain form of extreme inequality. 
And this extreme inequality is at the root of what I'm trying to get at, at the, in the book. So you may be a libertarian or a conservative who says that extreme inequality is necessary to motivate people to work hard. So, you know, I see somebody with a Bugatti or a Lamborghini or, you know, whatever, a big house, a private jet, big private yacht. And because I want those things and I want them for not only myself, but for my children, I'm going to really innovate and I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to do really well. And that's going to make it all better off for everybody in society. That's their argument. I think the work of somebody like Thomas Piketty in France, uh, it totally contradicts that, right? I think that there's a very clear sense in which extreme inequality actually makes it, actually makes society more conservative. We take fewer risks. We are less likely to challenge the status quo. We're less likely to be entrepreneurial because the risks of falling are so severe. So we, we live in a world in which I think these patriarchal institutions and practices, and as you're right, there is no patriarchy to smash. There aren't a bunch of guys in a room who are controlling everything. <laughs> this is completely integrated into our everyday life practices. And the only way to fight it is to rethink those everyday practices. But in order to do that, we have to be willing to understand that the thing upon which patriarchy sort of rests is inequality. Patriarchy is incredibly useful for not only upholding unequal relations between people in a given society, but then perpetuating those unequal relations intergenerationally. And that's the key moment where we need to intervene is in that intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. Yeah, that's all absolutely right. That's great. I I want to throw one thing out real quick, and maybe this is a false road we shouldn't go down because I do want to get to the actual utopias. But I'm thinking, you know, one of the problems that obsesses me is, you know, when I was first taught like a distinction between, I think my professor used to, this was an undergrad between like a gynocentric feminism, a woman centered feminism, and and a humanist feminism, which had sort of the idea that, you know, the humanist feminism, the system is okay. The problem is that it's men who are benefiting from it. And the solution is to get um, women in the positions of power, that sort of thing. Uh, the gynocentric feminism, right. So humanist feminism is wrong, right? And then, but then gynocentric feminism was sort of the idea that like women have a, a, a different way of being in the world. I had my students recently read um, a commencement address by Ursula Le Guin, where she says, you know, I don't want you success to have success. What I want you is to not have power over others. And it seems to me this, this, this comes clearly from anarcho feminism, but the thing I'm always worried about doing is this essentializing move that we talked about before, where you don't want to say like, oh, well, you know, cause the humanist feminism can even blend into this. Oh, if we just have female CEOs, we'll have childcare for 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 everyone and margaret so I, thatcher anybody margaret yeah, thatcher sorry it's, it's, does not yeah. work so yeah so what we need is some form of i would say like socialist feminism that takes is is sensitive to that understands what women's lives are like and we can sort of avoid this it seems to me a false distinction and i just i thought you might be able to put this better than i could so before we start talking about utopias i wanted to see if you had thoughts on this that could be useful to me and I mean, I guess also the listeners. Yeah. So, I mean, here, of course, you know, I'm a big Alexandra Kalantai sort of fangirl. I have a whole podcast dedicated to this woman, right? And she was definitely somebody who believed that men and women, and of course, you know, this is the early 20th century. It's actually the late 19th century and early 20th century. You know, she's definitely speaking in heterosexual cisgender terms. So just keep that in mind when I use these words, because it's important to understand the historical context within which I'm speaking. The key thing here is that she saw bourgeois feminism as a threat because mm. bourgeois feminists were all about getting privileges to wealthy women and what Clara Zetkin in Germany called the upper 10,000. And what Kalantai and Zetkin were really concerned about was basically what we would think of as sort of ordinary people. And 
their rights were only going to be realized in collaboration and with the complete camaraderie with working class men. So, so there's this big tension in the history of feminism, which really goes back to the middle of the 19th century. You had some women who were like, we need to have our own women's parties and we need to advocate for our own women's goals and the right to vote and the right to own property and the right to professions and education. And then you really had like a huge mass of working class women who said, actually, our real enemies are not men, it's the bourgeois. And together with men, we're gonna lock arms and we're going to fight for a more just society. And, and, and these were very much self-identified socialists and communist women. Now, there's always been this other anarcho-feminist tradition. And, and that, I think, comes from a very similar place, which is that, you know, look, if we're going to abolish the state, if we're going to live in a post-state world, we are going to have to find ways to create human relationships that transcend these gender boxes that the state wants to put us in. And I think it's really valuable to, to stop for a second and recognize how often the state wants us to choose a box, right? And even if the state, you know, is giving us other options of, of, of you know, of, of non-binary or, or whatever, or, you know, do not want to answer this question, <laughs> most, of, most people will just check the box that they feel most appropriately represents their gender. So, you know, you have the M and you have the F. And that determines your insurance rates. That determines whether or not you get called up for selective service in the United States. That determines all sorts of, you know, basic information about you. And why? Why do we even still have that box. What is that box doing? And here's where, you know, your question about the gender essentialism, it comes in. And, and I'm very critical of this, actually, because I don't like it when people want to associate a certain set of ways of being in the world, dressing, speaking, thinking, acting, to a certain box. That seems to me so anachronistic and so limited. And yet, here's where I will draw on the work of people like Gayatri Spivak. I do think that feminists, even socialist feminists and anarcho-feminists have used this concept of strategic essentialism. That occasionally, if you're fighting a military dictatorship in Argentina, it makes sense to put forward your identity as a mother, for instance, mothers of the disappeared, or women in black, right? If you are like um, Vandana Shiva in India and you're trying to make an eco-feminist argument about not ravaging the planet, you can say, oh, well, we as women are somehow more connected to the earth, and so therefore we have, <laughs> we have this responsibility to defend it. So there's, there's a political strategic essentialism that emerges occasionally. And while I can be critical of that essentialism, and I, I, I am critical of that essentialism because sometimes I think it does do more harm than good, in those particular cultural contexts and in those historical circumstances, a military dictatorship in Argentina or you know ecological devastation in India, sometimes the only way to get people to listen to change their practices is to use a very strategically mobilized version of essentialized gender identity. So it's complicated. I mean, I don't think there's a good answer to this question, but I will agree with you that at the end of the day, I think for both socialists and anarchists, I would hope that we can transcend the boxes, that the boxes really ultimately serve the state and they serve capitalism. And there will be a moment in the future where the boxes won't matter anymore. And I really look forward to that moment <laughs> when we're not in those boxes anymore because the boxes are very limiting for both, both, you know, um, uh, both boxes. And, and again, even though you expand the boxes and I'm fully in favor of expanding the boxes, they're still boxes. Ultimately, what we want is an infinite number of boxes so that boxes don't matter anymore, right? I don't want you to just keep adding them so that, like, you know, Facebook can use the algorithm of how we self-identify to better advertise to us. I actually want the box to be 
absolutely, completely irrelevant to who we are as people. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I can't tell you the hours I spent talking about Spivak's concept of, you know, strategic essentialism in grad school with friends, uh, hours and hours. Um, Let's move on from that and let's get to uh, Utopia. And I'll just start with the title. Of course, you know, I'm super sympathetic to the idea of an everyday utopia. But you also know, as you address in the book, you know, utopianism has has a bad name sometimes. And it's precisely because when we imagine utopia, we tend to imagine, or in popular culture, it's frequently imagined a totalitarian utopia, a dystopia, something in fact, if you think about something like 1984, the very category of the everyday is is gone. The pub does no longer exist the way the way it should. The family has become totalitarian. Utopia is so often the opposite of the everyday in our in our imagination. And I really appreciate you, you know, taking a stand against that. Yeah. I mean, I think we have to take a stand against that because, you know, I start with the Pythagoreans. Actually, that's not true. I start with Chattahoyuk, right? In, in Turkey, I start with the Neolithic. So I go way, way, (laughs) way, way back, but we don't have written sources. All we have is archeological evidence about what Look, what the everyday looked like in that era. But but with the Pythagoreans, we actually have this wonderful text, The Life of Pythagoras by Iambiclus, that gives us a sense of how the Pythagoreans lived. And I mean, most of us know Pythagoras for the Pythagorean theorem, but we don't realize that the guy was, he was a communist and he was a feminist, which is weird. When I say that to people, they're like, <laughs> are you like, what's wrong with you? Like, that's not true. Like people, like that's totally fake news. It's like, no, just look it up. Like, take five minutes and Google that thing and read it, and you will see that it's true, right? That he lived, essentially, they left mainland Greece, they created a commune in what is now southern Italy in Croton, and they believed that living together and owning their property in common and treating men and women equally would allow them to be more free to explore the mysteries of the universe and mathematics, which is kind of inspiring in a way to think that all those years ago, right, those millennia ago, there were people who said, hey, let's do something differently. We also know from Iambiclus that Plato, uh, when we talk about the Republic and his imagining of Calypolis, most people want to attribute that to the way the Spartans lived. But in fact, Iambiclus tells us that Plato was actually quite inspired by the Pythagoreans. He was really curious about this way of life, of treating men and women equally, of owning property in common. And so, look, I think that a lot of the way that we live today is a hangover of 20th century anti-communism, the Red Scare and McCarthyism, especially in the United States. And so when we think, when we hear the word property in common, (laughs) we're not thinking of the Pythagoreans and we're not thinking about Plato, nor, by the way, very importantly, are we thinking about Acts 2 and 4 of the Bible, where it's very clear that the followers of Jesus owned their property in common. And when any of them had need, those among them that had property sold it and put it at the apostles' feet so that it would be redistributed among others. And it's not just in Christianity. We can look at the Essenes, which was a Jewish uh, group of people who lived between the second century AD and the first century, sorry, the second century BC and the first century AD. We can look at the early monastic followers of the Buddha they all had a very similar conception of property in common, but, and, uh, and also collective child rearing and women's equality and so on and so forth. But when we hear those words, we immediately think of 20th century state communism um, in Eastern Europe. We think of the Soviet Union and we think, oh my God, the gulag, oh my God, the travel restrictions, the shortages, all of those evil things. And I think that we, one of the goals of the book is to say, okay, yeah, there were these experiments in Eastern Europe. They didn't work out so well. They had a lot of drawbacks. I'm not going to deny that for one second. But these ideas, these fundamental principles of how we should reorganize our private lives, 
You find them in Judaism. You find them in Christianity. You find them in Hinduism and Buddhism. You find them among anarchists and feminists and environmentalists, utopian socialists and communists. Almost everywhere you look, interestingly, you find the same exact prescription of how we should be living our private lives in order to be more connected and contented. And I would argue that for the 21st century, as we move forward, it's also about being more ecologically sustainable, less lonely and isolated, and less unequal as societies. A few things. First, I, I, I agree with all of that. Secondly, I just a brief shout out to the listeners. Um, if you're following along with my Kim Stanley Robinson series, the third book in the Three Californias trilogy, Pacific Edge, was running through my mind all through while I was reading Kristen's book. Because in that in that book, I think there's one character who lives by himself. And, you know, no no one objects to that. There's no democratic socialist police who tell him that he's using too many resources, comrade, and you know, move to the gulag. But most people, they it's 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 communal living, and it's not just communal living right there. But there's a tradition of having families all over the world that you're connected to by video conferencing and and traveling. And it feels in the Pacific Edge very everyday, very natural, very believable, very doable. And yet, if you're like me, you know, living in in my single family home. That's most days during the summer, at least it's just me and my two small children with my wife at work. And there's no one to talk to because everyone else is at work and all their kids are at camp. It, it's, it's so incredibly isolating and difficult. And as you know, Kristen, I am very uh, worried about the, the, the forms that state socialism took um, and that it does, it does concern me. And it's uh, obviously anyone who has, you know, anyone who knows what happened in the Soviet Union and is not concerned by that, it seems to me is silly. Anyone who thinks that that's the only way, you know, Stalinism is the is the only option, which is the premise. I mean, I am both anti-communist, if, if by communism you mean Stalinism, obviously, and of course also anti-anti-communist, if, if by that you mean, oh, well, your option is America in the 1950s or the Gulag. Those those are the only two options. I will, I guess this is the point where I, you know, raise the anarchist critique, which says like, well, if you're worried about the excesses of state socialism, why don't you just try fucking non-state socialism, right? Like, isn't that, isn't, that's, is, isn't that just uh, the, the answer? I mean, why do, why do we need the state, I guess? Yeah, and so, you know, here's where I feel like I am, I use this term sometimes, I'm left fluid, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a left fluid person. Love it, I'm, I love it. I'm non-binary in this respect because, <laughs> because I'm, there are some moments where I'm very down with Noam Chomsky's idea of expanding the floor of the cage. Like we're in the cage and if I can get my state, whether it's democratic or non-democratic, to expand universal health care or to give me universal child care or to give me a universal basic income or a citizen's dividend, or to institute some kind of library socialism. If the state is in a position to respond to democratic input from its constituents to create programs that are going to make the lives of those constituents better, then I am not going to stand in the way of that project. I'm sorry. I mean, yes, I understand the theoretical fear that if we have library socialism, that we could all end up in the gulag. I mean, I, I understand that people somehow feel that, you know, free tools might be the first step to Siberia. Um, however, on the other hand, so, so I'm being a little bit facetious there, but, 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 but I do think that there is a place that the state can play. And I have to say that as a feminist, the state has played a role in expanding rights to women, which have been really significant. I would also say this for people of color the and for people, you know, LGBTQIA plus people, the state has played a role in actually expanding 
certain kinds of rights and privileges that were only available to white people or to men or to straight people in a way that has been, if not productive, but then at least somewhat reducing of the suckage that it was to be in that category, <laughs> if suckage is a word, right? There's like a, the relative suckage factor here that I'm really concerned about. So, so that's, that's like, the, this is where my left fluidity comes in. I wanna say we have a responsibility to address given that there is a state and given that we live at least theoretically in a democracy that is supposed to be responsive to its constituents, we have a right and a responsibility to address our demands to that state. On the other hand, and that was, by the way, my, my, my first kind of more popular book was called Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence, which was precisely about what states can do. This book, everyday utopia is, is in the absence of a state that is responsive. And I'm really thinking this through because I fear that maybe Donald Trump will get reelected in 2000, you know, 24, we could be living in a, I don't even want to think about what we'd be living in, but all I'm saying is, is that if we are in a situation where the state is unresponsive, are there things that we can do in our own lives that will make us more free. So this is where prefigurative politics come into play. Can we live our lives in a daily way where the state doesn't exist, where it doesn't actually intrude in our relationships with other people, with our in our relationships with our children, with our parents, with our partners, with our comrades, colleagues, neighbors, students, whatever, mentors. There's so many people whose lives touch us in different ways. And I really love the idea of swarm theory, you know, where you have a node that is connected to eight other people around it. It's not like this sort of Rosa Luxemburgian herd theory, right? It's very much a different way of imagining social relations. And the anarchists, to me, offer a vision that is really hopeful, that in the absence of the state, that in the absence of capitalism, that in the absence of prefigured structures of how we should or shouldn't behave, how we should or shouldn't live or love or raise our children, that we have a kind of fundamentally beautiful creativity, adaptivity, adapt, adaptivity, is that the right word? I creativity. Don't, I, I don't yeah. know. <laughs> creativity, flexibility, and adaptivity. I think adaptivity is the word that, that I'm looking great. for. We'll go, we'll go Sound right to me right now, but I think that's the word. So this is where I this is where I just love David Graeber, right? I love what, what Graeber does, and I just recently taught his fragments of an anarchist anthropology. And as somebody who's an ethnographer and who works in this field, I absolutely love this idea that human beings as a species are just weirdly flexible and adaptive and creative in ways that, you know, some other species are not. What, what marks us as interesting and different is our adaptive nature, our flexibility, our creativity. And here's where I think it really matters, Graham, is that we have a set of social relations we have states, we have economies, we have families that are really the product of the last 300 years where the primary driving ideological force was that we lived on an earth that had abundant and never ending resources. And so we created a set of hierarchies and practices and family forms to adapt to this view of the earth as kind of a boundless entity from which we could extract endlessly. And the inequalities and the hierarchies that are produced from our family forms and our social forms and our economic and political forms reflect this underlying idea that we have a never ending kind of pool of resources and that that economic growth, endless economic growth is good. It is positive. 
you know, we have more things. We have better cars. We have nicer phones. We have air conditioning. I mean, I'm literally in southern Germany where we're suffering through a unprecedented heat wave. And there's no air conditioning here. And there's no, there are, people don't even have fans here because it's never been this hot. And here's the sad reality is like you can either reorganize politics so that the heat wave doesn't repeat itself. We could reorganize our family lives. We could reorganize our economies so that the heat wave doesn't repeat itself or all the rich people are going to run out and buy air conditioning, which is probably <laughs> what's happening right now so that they won't suffer from the heat waves. And then all of the, you know, what I mean, this is what I'm saying is that we, the, the political, economic, familial, and domestic forms that we have represent a reaction to a certain set of beliefs about the abundance of nature. And now that we are living in a world, if you're in the Southern United States right now, or if you're in Europe right now, that is rapidly heating and where nature is not going to be so abundant in the future, we have to rethink very quickly the way that we organize our private lives and our polities and our economies. And here's where I think the anarchists have something over the socialists is that states take a long time to change. States are sluggish. They're like, they move in molasses. They are slow, just by design, bureaucratic. People, individuals, families, communities, neighborhoods, workplaces are dynamic. And if we're going to change our behaviors to adapt more quickly to the climatic and geographic and environmental challenges that we're facing, literally starting right now. But I don't even want to think about in 20 years or 30 years when, you know, your kids and my kids are grown. We can't rely on the state. We have to be creative in our own lives. And there are so many ways that we can be. And that's what I'm trying to say in the book. So it's not that I'm abandoning the idea of expanding the floor of the cage, which I think is still really important. I'm not saying that we still shouldn't address claims to the state. I mean, that's where maybe I'm just of an older generation than you are, and I still have some faith that the state can be responsive. But recognizing that in the absence of state power, in the absence of state willingness to change, or in the face of state sluggishness, which is just the reality of most states. I mean, again, I have to say, I'm in Germany. I've never been in a more bureaucratic country <laughs> in the world, right? Have, have you been to Japan, Kristen? Oh, I lived in Japan for three yeah. years. It's so, more, and you think Germ Germany is more bureaucratic? Germany I, is worse than Japan. Trust oh, me on this one. Yeah. yeah. Trust me mm. on this one. Uh, Germany is really, really slow. It, when it comes to everything, it's like triplicate, you know, and then like 15 people have to sign off on it. I mean, I thought that like state socialism was bureaucratic. And then I'm like, no, it's because they adopted like, you know, Austria, Hungarian and Prussian practices. Prussian practices. <laughs> yeah. Prussian practices. <laughs> but nevertheless, all I'm saying is, is that why I wrote this book and why I think it's so important to think creatively is that we do have the power ordinary people in our daily lives to make even the smallest incremental changes that will ultimately be more efficacious in the long run than anything that I think we can think our states are going to do in the short run. I mean, it's just, it's about playing the short game and the long game. And I think that we, what anarchist theory does for me is to open my mind to this possibility of prefigurative politics in a way that makes me realize and that I want other people to realize means that we can right here and now make changes that are ultimately going to be better for everyone. And they're not necessarily going to slide into, total into totalitarianism <laughs> because they're not top down. They're actually bottom up. And, and, and maybe there's a role for the top down I'm not saying that there isn't, but there's a very important role for the bottom up. Yeah, well, I like the old Jane Adams idea that when once the grassroots generates solutions, there's a place for the government in helping spread those ideas and scale them up. But that's very different from the government generating and implementing those ideas to begin with. Exactly. Um, 
that seems like a great place to end, but I, I feel compelled to say, is there anything else you want to make sure we cover before we wrap this up? Anything else that I want to cover? Oh, wow. I mean, you know, first of all, thank you so much for this invitation. It has been really a pleasure to engage in this way because, as I said, I feel like my most poignant interlocutors these days are usually the anarchists because they're coming at me with a, a set of concerns and genuine concerns that are about the role of the state kind of in the long run. That being said, I want to end, the one thing that we haven't talked about and that is really important to me and to my book is hope and the importance of hope because I think that we live in a world where a lot of people, especially young people, are losing hope. They're, they're immobilized by despair, uh, particularly in the face of the, cri the climate crisis, which, you know, again, if you're sweltering right now in southern Germany or in Texas or in, you know, Louisiana or Arizona, it's hard to ignore how hot, literally hot it is. We've just entered into one of the hottest years on earth on record. So the despair is real. And we live in a culture, and I would specifically say here about the United States, we live in a culture that is constantly feeding us dystopian visions of the future. So their new Black Mirror series just dropped. And, you know, we're constantly bombarded by films like Parasite or, you know, television series like Squid Game. There, there are all these very, very negative views of the future. And we have to understand that hope is to the future what memory is to the past. It is a cognitive capacity. And this is what I absolutely, again, love about David Graeber's work, you know, there are so many things I could say about his work, but when I teach it and when I read it, I always come away with this feeling of possibility that the future could be different. This, this, it flexes my cognitive capacity to hope. So if you think of memory as a cognitive capacity, it means like if I'm good at remembering things, I take an exam and I remember like all the things that I learned in class. Or if I go to the grocery store without my phone, I remember all the things on my grocery list or I remember phone numbers. Like we can actually do things to train our memory. We can actually strengthen the cognitive capacity to remember. And many social psychologists talk about the cognitive capacity of hope as, as the an analog towards the future. Like hope is the ability to imagine a future that you want to see and then to sort of figure out pathways to get there and different strategies for overcoming the obstacles and challenges that you will inevitably face. And so if we think of hope as a, ca a cognitive capacity that it, in the same sense as memory is a cognitive capacity, too many people today, in my experience, and I'm a college professor like you, right? Too many people, they have let their cognitive capacity to hope atrophy. They've forgotten what it is to hope actively, out loud, together, arms locked with big groups of people to see the future that they want to see. And so one of the biggest messages that I want people to take away from my book is that one of the beauties of studying the history of utopia and utopian communities and utopian ideas, whether you disagree with them or not, and I make it very clear, by the way, in the preface to this book, that just because I talk about a utopian community does not mean I agree with it or that I'm exonerating it from all of its failures. Many of these communities completely, you know, crashed and burned in negative ways. But one of the things that studying utopian communities does is it flexes, like just like lifting weights in the gym, you know, it flexes our cognitive capacity for hope. And we, given all of the challenges that we face right now in the 21st century, going into this future that is so uncertain, we need dreams. We need radical social dreams. And reading the history of Utopia allows us to understand that dreams and radical social dreams are part of what make humans humans. So 
that's what I really, really want people to recognize is that, yeah, it may feel like I'm just talking about these random utopian communities from the past, but what's more important is that dreaming of the future, this is where we come back to Star Trek, right? Dreaming of the future, imagining what the future might look like, living that future prefiguratively, even if it's not here yet, is strengthening in a muscle that we will all really need in order to survive in the next 100, 150 years. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's so valuable. I think the despair people feel is because they feel like the government will not respond. The governments will not respond. And, you know, two things to that. First, if you're acting anarchically, if you're making changes in collaboration with other people around you, you don't have to wait for the government. And then the other thing I'll say, this is one of my deepest held beliefs. Every government is ultimately democratic enough people i mean we don't you know and if enough people move if enough of these clusters crystallize and get big enough the government will respond and the government will respond quickly and all of a sudden if the people demand it the bureaucracy and the sluggishness and the inattention matter but that doesn't mean the solution is to go out and demand it right now. You're going to find yourself at the head of an army of none. The solution is to build small things right now in your everyday life, and you will be surprised how quickly that can become big things. Although we are told that that's simply not how it works, and this is just the most important election of our lifetimes, and in the meantime, you don't have to do anything in your everyday life. And thank you for keeping that hope of everyday change alive. Thank you so much, Kristen. This was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. It was really, really a pleasure to speak to you. <laughs>